once again, time for questions and answers. This is where you post your questions. I'll answer them. So wherever you're watching any of the videos on the YouTube channel, just go ahead and put a short question in and I will answer it here. All right, let's get going. The Epic Duck 13, should we terraform Mars or adapt to its current conditions? I really like this idea because Mars right now is awful. It is super inhospitable to all life on Earth. But we have life forms like tardigrades or like hardy lichens that live in Antarctica that can almost survive on Mars. So you can imagine us modifying them genetically as we terraform Mars and make it warmer and thicken the atmosphere and we find life forms that are close and maybe we make them more lifelike and we can kind of meet Mars halfway. We make Mars a little bit more habitable but then we also modify ourselves to be able to better live on Mars. It would truly create a completely different genetic group of human beings that are specialized for living on Mars. It's a great idea. Nick Wilde. When will the universe end? We've done a bunch of videos about this, but the gist is that we don't think the universe is going to end. That the universe is going to continue to expand and the expansion is going to accelerate and all of the fuel for hydrogen is going to get used up and all the stars are going to die and the universe is going to continue to expand and eventually everything will just be black holes and dead matter that was never able to make it into a star forever. And this universe is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just going to get more and more stretched apart but nothing else is going to happen forever. And astronomers call this the heat death of the universe even though it's not going to be hot, it's going to be the, I don't know, the death of heat. And, and happiness. Every effing name take. Dude, what's the point in showing you in the forest on every uh, video? We shoot outside for two reasons. One, we live on Vancouver Island in Canada and it's beautiful here. We've got beautiful trees and mountains and lakes and rivers. It's awesome and uh, we love to be out in the forest as much as we can and it's, we thought you would enjoy seeing this scenery as well. The second reason is that it's a lot easier. Shooting outside, the light for your camera is, is just, you have to do a lot less work. And so we can go and take our camera, find a nearby forest, set up, shoot. We don't have to have set it up in a studio. We don't have to shoot indoors. We don't have to be in, you know, in various buildings and deal with artificial light. So we do it because it's beautiful, we think, and we do it because it's a lot simpler. It makes our lives a lot easier when we shoot our videos. Northern Chev. Can a black hole exist without an accretion disk? In theory, I wouldn't think you could detect one without witnessing its effects on something nearby, like a star. When a black hole is actively feeding, when it's got material falling into it, that's when you get this accretion disk because it's like a, it's like a bathtub that is overflowing the drain and so the material is waiting to go into the black hole and it sort of piles up in this accretion disk around it. But if the black hole has run out of food and it's consumed everything around it, there will be no accretion disk and you can't spot it visually. The only way that you can know the black hole is there is by its effect gravitationally, how it is interacting with some binary object. If it's got a star that's going around it, then you can see the star getting whipped around by something. So if there is no uh, binary object, if there is no material falling into it, the black hole is effectively invisible and there, there could be very close black holes that we can never see because they don't have any object around them and they're not feeding right now. Blind PT, can someone please answer me? I've searched everywhere but didn't find anything about it. How is it possible to find any form of antimatter in the universe when in the labs it disappears? When antimatter touches matter, it explodes and they annihilate and release the E equals MC squared amount of energy. So if antimatter is being generated, and they're, they're you know, here on Earth when we generate it in particle accelerators, as soon as it touches matter, it explodes. And, and actually doctors use this to diagnose uh, parts of your body with a PET scanner, positron emission scanner. Anyway, uh, so, but there are also uh, natural ways that antimatter can be produced in the universe around black holes, very violent explosions, supernovas, things like that. And when that antimatter is generated, it runs into matter very quickly 
and annihilates. And in fact, astronomers can see the antimatter that's out there in the universe, not because they can actually detect the antimatter, but they detect the explosions. And they can see where the antimatter explosions are happening, and then know that there's antimatter being generated there, and it's annihilating almost as quickly as it's created. For Mark Duck 666. Hey Fraser, what's your favorite stellar object that's visible to the eye from the Earth? Saturn. A thousand times Saturn. I, the greatest object to look at through a telescope, a small telescope, is Saturn. And seriously, I, if you have never looked through a telescope and seen Saturn with your own eyeballs, you need to add this to your life's bucket list. It is just mind bending to look through the eyepiece of a telescope and see Saturn with the little ball and the rings, and then you look up in the sky and there's this bright star and that's Saturn and it's in the eyepiece. So that is absolutely my favorite object to look through a telescope with. Philip Hughes, Fraser, do the laws of physics prevent future humans from ever leaving the local group? Could we cheat with a warp drive? We could always totally cheat with a warp drive. If you can go faster than the speed of light, then you can go anywhere and you can do anything. But the problem is, is that a warp drive might violate the laws of physics and just not be possible. And I don't care how many episodes of Star Trek and Star Wars we've watched, the laws of physics say you can't go faster than the speed of light. But the local group is you know, a bunch of galaxies that are collected by gravity, and there are other galaxies that are around us that are further away. According to the laws of physics, we can reach any galaxy that is within, essentially, the speed of light of us. So if we can get going 99% the speed of light, we can reach other galaxies that are even outside the local group. And this is, this is probably what our future robot uh, creations will do when they have fully colonized the Milky Way and they'll reach out to Andromeda and they'll reach out to these other galaxies and they will develop methods to travel closer and closer to the speed of light and they will attempt to reach every single galaxy within the Hubble sphere, whatever is not going faster than the speed of light away from us, they will try to get to it and try to colonize it and use it. That is sort of the inevitable future of the colonization of the universe. Fresh and squeezy. Are there planets that have no spin at all? If so, what would the gravity be like there? There are situations where a planet can get tidally locked to its star. So if it's very close to the star, just like our moon is tidally locked to the Earth, the planet will be tidally locked to its star and it will show the same face. So effectively, it's not really rotating. It's, you know, it's turning once as it goes all the way around the star, but it's not really rotating. What will be the impact if you were there? Well, when we're on Earth, when we stand at the equator, because the Earth is turning, we're feeling a bit of a centripetal force outward that is reducing our weight. Not very much, like a very small amount, but it is reducing our weight. So if you were on one of these planets that wasn't spinning as quickly, you wouldn't have that same weight reduction. You would weigh sort of exactly the same, whether you're at the equator, whether you're at the poles, your weight wouldn't change. But here on Earth, your weight changes a tiny little bit when you're on the equator compared to when you're at the poles. The faster, if the Earth spun faster and faster and faster, you would weigh less and less. And I'm sure you're wondering, could you fly off the planet Earth? But actually, you know, I think the Earth would tear itself apart before you were thrown off into space. Hemel Karjan, isn't the observable universe around 45 light years in all directions? This is so complicated. When we look out into space, the furthest that we can see is light that has left objects 13.8 billion years. And we see this in all directions, and this is the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this is essentially, a long time ago, the entire universe was this tiny singularity, and then, and then it got to a point where the light could move through the universe. And then all of those, and then those places now are 13.8, the light has taken 13.8 billion years to get to us. But that's because light moves at light speed. At the same time, the universe itself has been expanding. And so the places where that light left are actually much, much further away. And this is the 45 light years that you're talking about. So whenever we talk about this, and I mentioned this in the last question show, like whenever I say the universe, I'm talking about the observable universe. And that is all the material that we can see where the light left up to 13.8 billion light years away, 13.8 billion years ago, but that material is now 45 billion light years away. It's very complicated, but 
you know, I will try to be very careful whenever I mention size and space. But at the same time, just hold those two numbers in your head. The light you see left 13.8 billion years ago. That, that stuff is now 45 billion light years away. Hold them in your head at the same time. Ricky Smith. Fraser, did you plagiarize Vsauce's video on aliens? Similar, but the things you talk about are all explained in more detail. No, I didn't plagiarize Vsauce. I, I've watched a couple of Vsauce videos. I try not to so that I don't unintentionally plagiarize their videos. It's kind of the same thing with Isaac Arthur. I love Isaac Arthur's videos and I love Paul Matt Sutter's videos, but I don't want their ideas to sort of get into my head and then change the way I'm going to do my take on it. If you watch my episode on aliens, and actually after you mentioned that I went and watched the Vsauce uh, video on aliens, and we actually talked about totally different things. He talked about uh, bringing life back and protocols for the Apollo astronauts and stuff that I didn't even think to talk about. So it's sort of different and great. At the same time, uh, me, uh, Vsauce, all these other shows, uh, SciShow, Space, we're all pulling from the same source material, which is this wonderful amount of scientific research that the astronomers are doing. And so the kinds of stories that we're going to tell are, are overlapping. But the bottom line is that I write every single one of these scripts from scratch, by myself, out of my brain, and uh, use the basic research whenever I can. And I wish I could watch more of the other people's videos, but I don't want to get uh, kind of infected by their awesomeness. So, Lee Sabotka. Why wasn't the ISS designed to rotate in order to create artificial gravity? Is that still beyond our tech, or perhaps is the cost simply too high? The International Space Station is just version 1.0 of living in space. It doesn't rotate because making a spacecraft rotate is the next level of complexity. So it's not beyond our technology, although there are a ton of engineering challenges that we'll have to overcome. It's just the next great step for us to learn to live in space. ISS is the first one where People float around in space and they learn to do spacewalks and, and how do the recycling systems work and how do you go to the bathroom in space and all these challenges that they're trying to solve. I'm sure down the road an upcoming space station will be about, will have some kind of rotation to simulate artificial gravity and try to minimize the damage that the astronauts face when they're in that microgravity. So it's just, it's just we're too early along in the process. I, I wish we would, were more further along. I can't wait for the next spacecraft and space stations and whatever's the next stage in space exploration. All right, well, thanks everybody for sending in your questions. That was awesome, I had a lot of fun. Uh, as always, find some video, post a question. Every week I grab a bunch, answer them here, and uh, I look forward to doing this again next week. <laughs> All right, are you done cackling? Yeah.